Yes. Uh, good evening, Parikshit. How are you? Good evening, sir. How are you? <coughs> yeah, I'm doing well too. We are live on YouTube. Uh, let me start the recording. Sir. Yes, so uh, we should be this uh, a minute or so. So, uh, yeah, you can share your screen. I've already made you the co host, so you can share your screen. Can you see my screen, sir? Yeah, your voice, you can reduce the volume slightly. Just, it's too loud. It's too loud, okay, sorry. Yeah. Is it better now? Can you, you can go down a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, that's okay, better. So I, we can see your screen very well. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think it's eight o'clock. We probably wait for a minute and then we'll start. Sure. So, yeah. So this is part of the IGM Pure Talks. Uh, IGM Pure Talks are a series of uh, lectures by experts. The issue was um, there's a lot of gap uh, that we perceived uh, in the academics, uh, the students are working a lot, uh, the words which they are supposed to anyway, but then there needs to be an interaction between experts, uh, maybe didactic lectures and question answer sessions wherein they can get their doubts sorted out. That was the purpose of starting this. Mm -hmm. um, now, because of COVID, I think there are uh, so many uh, webinars going on. So probably will not continue uh, after we finish with this series. This series should be over sometime in November. Next year, uh, we're going to the plan was to take a gap of a month and then start a new series from January. But because I don't see a lot of attendance uh, uh, with the webinars because the uh, people uh, have a lot of webinar toxicity, rightfully. There are too many webinars going on every week, uh, every day there is something or other. So I think the gap is probably uh, has been bridged uh, and so we probably uh, can uh, divert our attention to something else. Uh, well, let's start now. It's two past eight. Uh, good evening. Yes, uh, today is the uh, next episode of Ideo Talks, wherein uh, we invite experts to uh, talk with us about any topic of their expertise. And then there is a question and answer session after that. As you all will agree, uh, gram negative infections is a graveyard for most, most oncology patients in the even, um, most hematology um, oncological patients. And uh, it's very important uh, to understand the resistance, uh, the mechanisms of resistance, and then uh, how we can uh, overcome the resistance. So Dr. Parikshit Prayag uh, is probably the best person to talk about this. He uh, has done his uh, American board certified um, the qualification in infectious disease from MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he's probably the only person who has uh, American Transplant Fellowship and he specializes in uh, transplant infectious diseases uh, from Stanford University. So he would be talking with us today about the resistant gram negative infections. And uh, it's going to be a series of the second in the series is going to be about the uh, uh, therapeutics of gram negative and today is going to be uh, the basics uh, of resistance so over to you parikshit yes 
so thank you so much parmit sir and uh, good evening everyone and thank you for having me um, as as parmit sir mentioned you know most of my training has been with immunocompromised patients so uh, really um, i feel like i am a part of you although officially i'm not qualified to be an oncologist but i really feel that whenever i talk, uh, spend time with hemon people i feel like i'm a, i'm a part of them so thank you so much for having me as parmit sir mentioned we'll be having this talk in two parts so essentially what i mean is since it's it's a complicated topic to cover so what happens is that you know within an hour if if i just hammer the kind of enzymes that we see and if i hammer the beta lactam beta lactam is inhibitor combinations or if if i just just go ahead with the theory a lot of times especially for our trainees it becomes a little difficult because again we have to remember that this is not your core branch it's, it's like someone telling me all the aml mutations in in an hour so i'll be forgetting them the next time around so instead of that what i thought is that we will be doing it slowly today what i am going to cover is i am just going to cover the mechanisms of gram negative resistance the kind of enzymes that we have world over the kind of enzymes that we see in india and more importantly how do we detect these enzymes now we have come to a stage wherein detection is important for clinical management and as parmit sir mentioned with the amount of gram negative resistance that we are seeing especially in your patient population especially in in settings like neutropenic sepsis we all have to get acquainted with these enzymes and we all have to get acquainted with the mechanisms of resistance um and then in in part b probably uh, uh, sometime next week um, as per your schedule what we will be covering is how do we actually treat these gram negative infections so then i'll be covering the dl dli combinations then how do we approach esdl organisms how do we approach carbapenem resistant bugs and then i will be going through a few cases actual cases of gram negative resistance combination therapy and so on so that is what we have so again like i mentioned today i'll be covering the mechanisms of resistance their epidemiology and how do we actually detect resistance so i'm going to be talking about epidemiology of gram negative resistance only briefly because the point of the talk is for this to be practically and clinically relevant so i'm not going to talk about it on you how gram negative resistance is a problem world over because we already know that i'll be talking about mechanisms in general i'll be spending most of my time on the enzymes which are involved and a few of the non enzymatic mechanisms and how do we detect these enzymes what has been our own in house experience in dinanath mangeshkar hospital what has been the experience of some of the tertiary centers like cmc vellore and other indian centers and i'll be also touching a little bit on cholestin resistance so as i mentioned you know let me start with the epidemiology as you would all expect india does poorly when it comes to gram negative resistance so if you see the countries with the highest increase in consumption of antibiotics we have more than doubled our antibiotic consumption in the last 15 years so if you see from 2000 to 2015 we have more than doubled our antibiotic consumption and that is more than any other country in the world again you can see from here that carbapenem sales across the country much to the delight of our pharma companies have been skyrocketing in india if you consider that with the western world if you consider that with the countries like netherlands and the us they have been pretty static but look at the subcontinent countries like india and pakistan there has been an exponential rise in the sale of carbapenem antibiotics this is not to say that you know every time it has been used it has been used incorrectly but it just uh, sort of gives you an idea that we have been leaning towards rampant misuse of these antibiotics and i think this is my last slide on epidemiology but i think this is the most uh, telling one if i can use that word because if you see in this slide if you concentrate on this figure on the right this is these are the who projections in 2030 and those to me are very scary because what it essentially means is that if you are practicing in 2030 and if your lab calls you and tells you that your patient is growing a gram negative bacteria in the blood then you, in, if you are sitting in india you can almost be 100% sure that that if it is klebsiella it is going to be resistant to carbapenem so i think that is a very scary projection that world over half of the klebsiella in in india all of the klebsiella are going to be resistant to carbapenem so imagine a situation wherein 100% of our klebsiella are going to be resistant to carbapenem i think that is a very very scary situation like i said even world over the projections are about 50% and even more so in india and then the figure on the left again talks about antibiotic consumptions uh, which we have touched upon 
So, so this was just uh, a little introduction to tell how grim the picture is. You know, you can go on and on and present all sorts of data about antibiotic consumption in India, in the Western world, how resistance rates are increasing. But I don't want to spend too much of time on that because especially for our trainees, I want to keep this as practically relevant as possible. So with that, let me go over to the mechanisms of gram-negative resistance, especially in beta-lactam antibiotics. So let's start from a, a few basics. When we talk about beta-lactam antibiotics, basically, we are talking about four classes of antibiotics. We are talking about our penicillins. So you have penicillins as well as synthetic and semi-synthetic penicillins. Then you have cephalosporins, uh, whom we all had a nightmare learning in pharmacology, all their four generations. Now we also have fifth generation cephalosporins. Then we have carbapenems, uh, prominently the ones used in India include imipenem, meropenem, ertapenem. Dori is not used so much. And then we have the monobactam called astrona. Again, the rest of the molecules in the monobactams are not clinically uh, used that much. So we have so basically four classes of beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and, and the monobactam, astrona. Why I included this slide is because throughout the lecture, I'm going to be talking about mechanisms of resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics. So before we use this word beta-lactam antibiotics, we need to know that beta-lactam means penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and astronam. These are the four classes of antibiotics which are included under beta-lactam antibiotics. So let's consider this gram-negative bacteria. So this gram-negative bacteria has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So this really forms the uh, basis of the uh, mechan mechanisms of resistance. So let's see what normally a beta-lactam antibiotic does. So if you can see here in the figure, these blue dots are beta-lactam antibiotics, which means that they are penicillin, cephalosporins, astronam, or carbapenems. So what the beta-lactam antibiotic does is that it enters the outer membrane. This is the normal process I'm talking about. It enters the outer membrane through these porin channels, and once it comes onto this inner membrane, it binds to these PBPs. So these PBPs are penicillin binding proteins. And because of the fact that it binds to these PBPs, it disrupts the cell wall. So the ultimate target of the beta-lactam antibiotic is to enter through the outer membrane and then bind to the PBPs. This is the normal process that we are talking about. Now, during this journey or during this uh, process, a resistance can develop at any point during this whole process. So one of the mechanisms of resistance will be that the beta-lactam antibiotic is not able to enter at all. And let's see this modified porin channel. Instead of this purple porin channel, now we have a modified red porin channel. So the beta-lactam antibiotic is not able to enter at all. And this is called a porin-mediated resistance. The second mechanism is clinically the most relevant world over. And that is the production of enzymes, which are known as beta-lactamases. So this is the second mechanism by which a gram-negative bacteria can become resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. So what do we mean by beta-lactamases? So since we have beta-lactams as our antibiotics, the bacteria produce enzymes which are known as beta-lactamases. So you can see these scavengers here. So between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, they destroy our beta-lactam. So they, that's why they are known as beta-lactamases. The third mechanism is that the antibiotic is able to enter it is not destroyed by beta-lactamases, but it is kicked out by the bacteria. So after entering, it is kicked out again. So this, these are efflux pumps by which it is kicked out. So this is the third mechanism. The fourth mechanism of action is modified PBP. So its final site of um, action is modified in such a way that we have a modified penicillin binding protein to which our beta-lactam antibiotic cannot bind at all. So this is again a more simplistic uh, version that I have created using uh, paint uh, instead of a, of, of a commercial diagram. So again, the, the figure illustrates what I have been talking about. So we have four mechanisms. One is at the bottom of the figure, you can see modified porin channels. So the antibiotic is not able to enter. Number two, we have efflux pumps. So it is able to enter, but then it is kicked out by pumps, which are known as efflux pumps. Number three is destruction by beta-lactamases. So, Number three is between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, our beta-lactam is destroyed by enzymes which are known as beta-lactamases. And then through the rest of the evening, we'll see how complex these beta-lactamases are. Again, remember beta-lactams are your penicillin, cephalosporins, astronam, and carbapenems. And the fourth mechanism is that you have modified PBPs. Look at number four here. You have modified PBPs 
so that the beta lactam is not able to exert its final mechanism of action so these are broadly four ways in which a gram negative bacteria can become resistant to beta lactam antibiotics so now let us see the enzymatic mechanisms first so we are going to see the beta lactamase enzymes which are involved in destroying the beta lactam antibiotics and then we will cover the non enzymatic mechanisms remember the non enzymatic mechanisms are mentioned either mutated proline channels efflux pumps or mutated penicillin binding protein so these three are non enzymatic mechanisms whereas our enzymes are the beta lactamase enzymes which destroy our beta lactam so let us see how complex these enzymes are and how we can come up with strategies to identify these enzymes and more importantly how can we come up with strategies to overcome this enzyme mediated resistance so let us start from very simple basics so when you talk about beta lactamases as i mentioned these are going to be enzymes that destroy our beta lactams so there is an increasing complexity of enzymes there are thousands of enzymes which have been described world over so these enzymes simply put can be either uh, classified according to what they destroy or they can they can have some other classification that i'll talk about so if you see the ones that destroy only the penicillin so this is an increasing order of complexity so the ones that destroy only the penicillins are known as penicillinases then you have got enzymes known as ampses which destroy penicillins plus up to the third generation of cephalosporins so up to the third generation of cephalosporins is up to ceftriaxone and ceftazidine these are third generation cephalosporins cefepime is a fourth generation cephalosporin so remember ampses cannot destroy cefepime they can only destroy up to the third generation of cephalosporins and penicillins then next you have esbls most of you must have heard about this term esbl so esbls are extended spectrum beta lactamases so basically they destroy penicillins and all generations of cephalosporins and that's why simply put carbapenems are the drugs of choice for them so esbls are <clears throat> extended spectrum beta lactamases which destroy penicillins and all cephalosporins remember both of these destroy the monobactam astrona so astrona i'm already it hasn't been included in this diagram here ampses as well as esbls both destroy astrona and then last but not the least we have carbapenemases you must have heard about some of these carbapenemases like ndms kpcs oxa 48 and so on depending on on uh, where you practice and and how much um, your institute does to identify these enzymes but i am sure most of you must have heard these names at least so these are carbapenemases which destroy all the beta lactams so again like i said this is an increase in complexity from simple penicillinases to the most complex carbapenemases there are thousands of enzymes that these gram negative bacteria can produce and depending on what enzyme they are producing we can expect what antibiotics they will be resistant to so this is the classification that i was talking about so this is our substrate based classification that i just explained so these can be penicillinases these can be esbls these can be ampses or these can be carbapenemases there is a more um, academic way of classifying these enzymes and uh, this is the amlers classification so amlers classification basically divides these enzymes into four different groups within each group you can have different types of enzymes so if you see the class a enzymes if you see amlers class a enzymes within class a you have penicillinases you have got esbls and you have got carbapenemases if you see class b then class b has only um, um, carbapenemases if you see class c class c has only ampses and if you see again class d class d has all sorts of enzymes like class a so penicillinases um extended spectrum beta lactamases as well as carbapenemases so let's talk a little bit about each of these classes so again remember if you just look at these enzymes right now it might it might be clinically irrelevant to you or it might be too confusing like i mentioned you know it's it's like teaching an id physician the different aml notations but slowly as you go into the depths of it you realize that these are actually clinically relevant terms that we use so it's actually important to know where what type of enzyme this bug is producing so let's concentrate on class a as i mentioned class a contains all types of enzymes so class a contains esbls as well as the carbapenemases which means that there are going to be certain enzymes in class a that destroy all cephalosporins and then there are going to be certain carbapenemases that destroy all the beta lactams which are known to us 
So let's see the class A ESDL food. The reason I have highlighted these five in red is that these are the most important clinically relevant class A ESDLs. So why are these enzymes named in such weird manner? There are different nomenclatures. For example, TEM is named after the first patient in whom it was found. So the patient called Temonera in Italy. This was Temonera is the last name of the patient. So this is the, that's why this enzyme was named named as TEM. SHV is named as SHV because of its chemical composition. So its chemical composition contains a sulf hydroxyl group. So that's why it's 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 named as a sulf hydroxyl variant. CTXM is named so because it preferentially destroys C4 taxin more than the other cephalosporins, and that's why it's named as CTXM. So this is how some of these enzymes are are named. But importantly, these are the five clinically relevant enzymes that you will see world over as well as in India. So TEM, SHV, CTXM, DER, and VEB. These are the five enzymes in class A ESDLs that you will see world over. In India, the most Prevalent out of these enzymes is CTXM. So if you if if some of you work in centers which which use a PCR based analysis, and I'll I'll show you our own in house data. We started doing the PCR analysis since last year. Um, initially, I I started doing it as as a part of my uh, project, and then later on uh, our lab also now does it commercially. Uh, so you 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 will know what sort of enzymes are being produced in India, but. most of the centers you will report that ctxm is the commonest enzyme for esbls that is produced in india so remember these five enzymes stem shv ctxm pr and web these are the five most important class a esbls in india where if you talk of the class a carbaminases then again you have kpcs smes ime and gs fortunately class a carbaminases are not very common in india so you will rarely see a case with kpcs the case is exactly the opposite in the western world in the western world kpcs are the main enzymes which which give carbapenem resistance so you will barely ever see kpcs in india or you will very very rarely see smes or emes or gs in india so again clinically group a carbapenemases are not very common in your practice in india clinically the kind of enzymes from group a that we need to know about in india are the esbls so again most of our esbls almost 90% or even more more than 90% of our esbls and almost 100% of our klebsiella isolates produce ctx anywhere between 80 to 100% last year in our laboratory out of all the isolates that were there almost 80% of the klebsiella isolates were esbl producers which means that for 80% of our klebsiella you already do not have cephalosporins as an option and the commonest enzyme has been ctx PER and VEB are more enzymes of Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. So remember, even among these, the first three enzymes are enzymes which are produced by Enterobacteria. So these are enzymes which are produced by Klebsiella, E. coli, Citrobacter, Enterobacter, and so on. Whereas PER and VEB are enzymes which are produced by Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. So these are your class A enzymes. So now, if I tell you that you have, let's say, a patient who who is who has AML. Was received a seven plus three induction chemotherapy, and then his blood culture grows klebsiella. So the lab calls you and tells you that you had cephalosporin because the patient had neutropenic fever, and the blood culture is growing klebsiella. If I tell you that this is a group A enzyme, based on this, these susceptibility patterns, which one would it be? That is the question. So let us analyze this. So here you have astuanam resistance, you have cefepime resistance. And you have ceftriaxone, ceftagidim resistance. So remember, these are third generation cephalosporins to which it is resistant. This is a fourth generation cephalosporin to which it is resistant. And carbapenems are susceptible. So I already know, and astuanam again is resistant. So what do I know? I know that this is an ESBL producing organism, which means that it is resistant to all cephalosporins, but it is susceptible to more all carbapenems. So this is an ESBL organism. So this is a klebsiella. producing an esbl enzyme so the question really is that which is the enzyme that this is likely to produce so now if this is a group a enzyme let us go back to our group a enzymes is this a carbapenemase no because the uh, patient here is showing susceptibility to carbapenem so this is not a carbapenemase which means that this is an esbl so remember as i mentioned so this is likely to be either tem shv or ctxm pr and vb as i mentioned are more enzymes of pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. As I mentioned, out of these three, 
clinically and epidemiologically the commonest is a ct exam so simply the lab tells me that this is the kind of pattern that we are seeing i will put my money on ct exam or if you are working in a in a setup where you don't have access to pcr uh, assays for these enzymes then if you see these blood cultures simply forget forget the question at the end but if you just see these blood cultures then you should think of ct exam as the uh, most likely enzyme involved here and in my next talk we'll see why it is important to know which enzyme is involved because these uh, because because knowing that changes our therapeutic decision so my approach to a patient who has ct exam will be very different from a patient who has a pr or a web in his um, blood cultures or a pr or a web uh, enzyme producing bug in his blood cultures so again therapeutic decisions differ so remember if you have a klebsiella which is in asbl the commonest enzyme in india is ct exam so if someone asks you to put your money if you are into betting and if someone asks you to put your money on on an enzyme seeing these blood cultures you should put your money on ct exam so the kpcs as i mentioned these are group a carbapenemases fortunately these are not very common in india so if you see if you see the kpc producers most of the western world is endemic for kpc so if you see the countries here in red these are endemic kpc producers whereas kpc is in uh, whereas the countries in blue are sporadic kpc producers which means that kpc is an imported enzyme in the blue countries whereas it is an endemic enzyme in the red countries so if you see, see northern america as well as southern america then you will see that these are countries where there is endemic kpc so most of their carba kpc whereas in india that is not the case whenever you find a patient with kpc that is a rarity in india so kpc is an enzyme that did not originate in india it originated in the western world and like covid 19 we have imported that enzyme this is not an endemic um setting for kpc so uh, i won't go into again the sub sub types of kpcs these are important again if you are working in a in a setup where kpcs are really prevalent so in the us for example the kpc 1 2 and 3 are the most uh, important ones i mean the why is because kpc 1 and kpc 2 are the most lethal out of this so again i won't go into the details but just to tell you that it is always important to know what enzyme we are dealing with when we are taking therapeutic decisions So while we are on class A, let us see this very important table of what is inhibited by what. So now, as we have beta lactam antibiotics, the bugs produce beta lactamase enzymes. So what did we come up with? We came up with beta lactamase inhibitors. So we went one step ahead in the game of chess and we invented beta lactamase inhibitors. So we have various beta lactamase inhibitors or BLIs as they are known. So we have clavulanic acid, we have sulbactam, we have tazobactam. and then we have the new player in the market which is known as avidactam you know right now in india avidactam is marketed as zavisefta or ceftazidim avidactam and then there are a few others in the pipeline which are in phase 3 studies like zidibactam or nacobactam so if you see the class a enzyme so let us compare tazobactam versus avidactam so what do we have tazobactam as commercially we either have it as uh, in combination with piperacillin or rarely we have it in combination with some cephalosporins but that is not a very established combination the more established combination with tazobactam is of course our piperacillin tazobactam so if you see uh, what tazobactam inhibits versus what avidactam inhibits then if you see ctxm avidactam is better at inhibiting ctxm than tazobactam shv and tem are actually weaker esbl so usually tazobactam as well as avidactam both will inhibit shvs And CT uh, and TEMS. Whereas if you see KPCs again, Tazobactam, which is a carbapenemase, Tazobactam will not inhibit, and Avibactam will inhibit. If you see the PER and the WEBS, which are as I mentioned, ESBLs of Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, both are poor at inhibiting. So really, what is the difference between Tazobactam and Avibactam? One important difference, although more important in the Western world, is that Avibactam inhibits KPCs and Tazobactam does not inhibit KPCs. the other important difference is which is relevant in the indian settings is that avibactam is a more potent inhibitor of ctxm compared to tazobactam so that's why whenever i have a ctxm producing bug which is clinically relevant so for example patient is in neutropenic sepsis and this is clinically relevant and the bug is which is being uh, uh, produced uh, or the bug is producing ctxm for example if i have 
ESBL Klebsiella producing CTXM, patient is in neutropenic sepsis, I would be a little hesitant in using Piprasilin Tazobactam, even though the lab tells me that it is Piprasilin Tazobactam susceptible. I would be more comfortable in using something like Ceftazidine Avibactam or a Carbapenem because this is an ESBL. So again, that is why it is important to know what enzyme we are dealing with because we base a lot of our therapeutic decisions based on these enzymes. So let us go to this next. Um, again, we have a culture which is similar to the last one. So third generation, fourth generation, cephalosporin resistant, carbapenem susceptible and astronam resistant. So again, once I look at this pattern, then I know that this is an ESBL producer because it is resistant to all cephalosporins and it is susceptible to carbapenem. So now I know that this is an ESBL producer. Once I know that this is an ESBL producer, uh, they've told me that this is a pseudomonas. So now I know that this is a pseudomonas which is producing an ESBL enzyme. So what are my options? My options are that it is either going to be a class A enzyme. Let us go back to our here. So my options are either it is going to be a class A enzyme which is going to produce an ESBL or it is going to be a class B enzyme which is going to be an ESBL producer. Remember A and D are the only classes that produce or that have ESBLs. C is AMP-C and B is only carbapenemases. So B contains only carbapenemases and C contains only AMP-Cs. So once I know that this is an ESBL producer, the enzyme has to be a class A enzyme or a class D enzyme. So let us, now we have already looked at class A enzyme. So if this would have been a class A enzyme, which one is it likely to be? As I told you, 10 SHV and CTXMs are more enzymes of Klebsiella and E. coli. Whereas PEI and WEBS are more enzymes of Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. So if the lab gives me such a report, then I already know that this is either going to be a class D enzyme, which is an OXA enzyme, or it is going to be a class A enzyme, which is going to be a PER or a WEB. So I would probably put my money again on this being a PER or a WEB. Now why this is important to know because, sorry, this is important to know because PR or webs are not very well covered by Avibactam and they are absolutely not covered by Tazobactam. Especially web is not inhibited by Avibactam. So empirically, when I look at these cultures or, or when if, if the lab tells me that this is a pseudomonas producing a web, I will not go for ceftazidine Avibactam. Again, I will go for a carbapenem in that setting. I will go for something like meropenem or imipenem. I will also, of course, not go for ertapenem because ertapenem, as you know, does not have any anti-pseudomonal activity. So I will go for something like meropenem or uh, imipenem in that setting. And I will not go for ceftazidine mavibactam. So again, these enzymes are important to know. Of course, as, as an oncologist or as a hematologist, uh, you don't really need to know all these enzymes and know it in depth. But the purpose of this lecture is to orient you that the, these are the kind of things now that we are doing in the world of infectious diseases and microbiology, which can sensitize you to, uh, for example, if you work in a tertiary care center after you finish your training, then you should urge that center to develop these systems wherein we are able to identify these enzymes. And I'll come to it later on in my talk. So with that, we have finished class A enzymes. So now let us go to class B enzymes. As I mentioned, class B contains only carbapenemases. So this is the long list of class B enzymes. It contains only carbapenemases. So there are no ESBLs, there are no AMPCs or no penic or pure penicillinases in class B. Class B strictly contains only carbapenemases, which means that class B has the most nasty enzymes. So the, these are enzymes that destroy all your antibiotics except astronam. So class B enzymes are enzymes that destroy all penicillins, all cephalosporins and all carbapenems. The only antibiotic that they do not destroy is Astyonam. So again, as you can see from here, class D is a very unique, sorry, class B is a very unique class that has many different enzymes. Clinical in India, the most important one is NDM. So you must have heard about this term NDM. So NDM stands for New Delhi Metallobetalactamase. So what is so special about NDM? The special thing about NDMs is that the location of these NDMs or the place where they are bound on the membrane is different. So in simple words, the NDM has a different structure from other carbapenemases and it is the most potent out of all the carbapenemases that have been described. So you will see that NDM gives very high MICs for all the carbapenems. So the other carbapenemases like KPC or some of the oxa carbapenemases, 
they are they do destroy carbon atoms but their destruction is a little less severe compared to indium so indiums are the most potent destructors of our carbon atoms and unfortunately in india indiums are indium so the map that i showed you for kpcs now exactly reverse it and you will have the indium map so the indium subcontinent as you can see from here we are endemic for indium producers so so really india is the home of indium whereas the us is the home of kpcs india is the home of indiums so how was this indium discovered this indium was actually discovered in a swedish patient who was visiting new delhi back in 2009 i believe he was admitted this patient was admitted in medanta and this patient had a bacteremia and this uh, this turned out to be a carva i think it was a klebsiella which had very high mics for meropenem and they took that isolate they sent it to houston houston has a, has the central uh, antimicrobial resistance institute in the us and they sequenced it so they did next generation sequencing and they found that this is a different enzyme compared to what has been described so far and since this patient had traveled to new delhi and this enzyme was found in new delhi they named it as the new delhi metallo beta lactamase india was generous enough to allow such uh, defamation unlike china initially when when they were talking about covid 19 they were thinking of naming covid 19 as the wuhan coronavirus but china opposed it and now we call it covid 19 so there is no mention of wuhan or china when you talk about covid 19 but we were generous enough to let them name this enzyme as new delhi metallo beta lactamase so now <clears throat> we it is it is almost uh, synonymous with resistance in the indian subcontinent so the indian subcontinent is the endemic region for this enzyme and what, what like as i mentioned what is bad about this enzyme this enzyme gives you higher mics than any of the other enzymes so if i can use this word it is the most potent out of all the beta lactamases that are known to us right now so unfortunately this is what we have to live with in india so most or many of our carbapenemases are actually endiums so very interestingly <clears throat> since although astronam is an antibiotic that is destroyed by all esbls and amcs it is not destroyed by ndms so that is a silver lining so it is a very a weird antibiotic in the sense that it is destroyed by less potent enzymes like esbls or amcs but the strongest out of all the beta lactamases which is ndm cannot destroy astronam so very interesting so class b enzymes cannot be inhibited by avibactam or tazobactam remember class b enzymes can neither be inhibited by avibactam or tazobactam they destroy all beta lactams except astronam very important <clears throat> so these were class b enzymes as i mentioned what is important from class b is that these are all carbapenemases ndm is the most important out of them clinically ndm gives you the highest mics neither tazobactam nor avibactam or any of the commercially available beta lactamase inhibitors like clavulanate selbactam relibactam weberbactam avibactam none of these bactams or beta lactamase inhibitors can destroy class b enzymes but funnily class b enzymes cannot destroy astronam so astronam is the only antibiotic which is stable against class b enzymes and as i mentioned remember india is endemic for these class b enzymes with that let us go over to class d so we have finished class a we have finished class b now we'll let us go over to class d i have kept class c for the end because class c is amp c these are amp c enzymes so let us go to the oxa family So again, class D enzymes is a huge family of enzymes. There are more than thousand oxas that have that have been discovered. What I want you to focus on is the last part here, which are oxa forty eight like. So again, oxa forty eight like. Why are they important? Is because these are enzymes or these are carbapenemases of Klebsiella and E. coli. So Klebsiella, E. coli, Enterobacter, all the Enterobacteriaceae uh, organisms, they produce. oxa 48 enzymes whereas oxa 23 is more of an enzyme of pseudo uh, acinetobacter and pseudomonas more so of acinetobacter and then which are the pseudomonal oxa again 5 10 50 these are the anti pseudomonal oxas again you might ask me that what is the relevance of you know knowing all these oxa numbers is it really that relevant or is it just a waste of our time especially as hematologists and oncologists knowing all these um, unlimited oxa numbers again i would say the answer is that partially it is important to know what oxas we are dealing with especially oxa 48 because oxa 48 is now identified in at least 80 hospitals the last time we did a survey in december we found that more than 80 hospitals across india 80 are identifying uh, five basic enzymes so oxa 48 is now identified in a lot of hospitals 
So again, it is important to know that it is the most co common OXA enzyme and it is an enzyme of the Enterobacteriaceae. And again, like NDM, India is endemic for OXA48. So if you see Middle East and India, these are places where we have a lot of OXA48. So now, already you know that if you are practicing in India and if you have a carbapenem resistant blood culture, then which carbapenemies are you likely to deal with? It is either going to be NDM or it is going to be the OXA family. We are not very uh, commonly dealing with KPCs. Because remember, KPCs, NDMs, and OXAs, these are the three most important carbapenemases. Out of that, KPCs are not very common in India. So OXAs and NDMs are what we have been dealing with. So again, if you look at class D enzymes, there are differences between Tazobactam and Azobactam. And that's why, again, I always like to know what enzyme I'm dealing with. <clears throat> so if you see OXA48, which is an OXA of Klebsiella E. coli Enterobacter, Azobactam inhibits it whereas Tazobactam does not inhibit it. Very important clinical difference because we have many of our Klebsiella's which are actually OXA48 producers. So that makes Ceftazidine Avibactam a very good choice for our OXA48 Klebsiella's, which is unfortunately not the case for Fipracillin Tazobactam. And Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas OXA's, again, both are disappointing. So Tazobactam as well as Avibactam, both are disappointing. Every enzyme, when we look at, we divide that into the class, we divide that into the, uh, into what it is destroying, and we divide that into the bug that it is producing, or the bug that is producing it. So, as I mentioned, you know, acinetobacter oxas are very different from Klebsiella E. coli enterobacter oxas. So, if you see the oxa family, then I am very comfortable in using avibacter when I know that this is a Klebsiella or an E. coli producing oxa, because I know that this is very likely to be an oxa 48. So, the entire oxa 48 family here, which contains OXA48, 162, 163, and 181. These are the four commonest OXAs. This entire OXA family is very well inhibited by Azubactam. And that's why Ceftazidine Azubactam or Zyvoseftah is an antibiotic that I love to use for our OXA-producing Klebsiella's. That is not the case for Acinator or Pseudo. So when I have an Acinator or Pseudo, which is producing an OXA, I usually do not use Ceftazidine Azubactam. I usually go for a polymyxin-based therapy. So that, that is an important clinical difference to know. And then last but not the least, let us come to our group C enzymes. So group Cs are AMP Cs. As I mentioned, AMP Cs are enzymes that destroy up to the third generation of cephalosporins. So you will have ceftriaxone or ceftazidine, which is resistant, but cefepime, which is susceptible. So cefepime is the fourth generation cephalosporin. So fourth generation onwards, it will be susceptible. And carbapenems will be susceptible. So this is the classical profile of AMC. So this is really the classical uh, pattern that you see in blood cultures when you have ESBLs and when you have AMCs. So you will have astronam, which is resistant to both. Then you have, you have carbapenems, which will work for both. As I mentioned, you know, carbapenems here should work for both. None of them are able to destroy carbapenems. And you will have cefepime will, will, will really tell you whether this is an AMC producer or an ESBL producer. And Azobactam, again, as I mentioned, destroys both, unlike um, Tazobactam. So now, which organisms are capable of producing an AMP-C? Not every organism. So not E. coli or Klebsiella. These are not uh, your amp -C producers. amp -C producers are very peculiar. They are, are remembered by the mnemonic spice. So, Seracia, Pseudomonas, then your indole positive bugs like Proteus, Morganella, Citrobacter, and Enterobacter. So these spice organisms are the organisms that produce AMP-C. Now, why is this important? AMP-C is an inducible enzyme. So what does what do you mean when you say that it is an inducible enzyme? An inducible enzyme is an enzyme which is not which may not be expressed initially, but as you use that antibiotic, that enzyme will be expressed. For example, initially, if I have a seracia which is susceptible to ceftriaxone, the, the lab tells me that this is a seracia which is uh, susceptible to everything. Now I put this patient on monocef or ceftriaxone. Remember, seracia is a part of an AMPC producing family. So what will happen is that when they start using ceftriaxone, after four to seven days, the seracia will produce AMPC. <clears throat> so do you, this is what I mean by inducible enzyme. Inducible enzyme is that when the bug sees a beta lactam antibiotic, only then it produces the AMPC. So then after four to seven days of therapy, Seracia will produce AMC enzyme and that ceftriaxone will be destroyed by AMC. So this is what I mean by enzyme induction. At the beginning of therapy, it may not be 
produced but down the road after 4 days 7 days usually at about 1 week of therapy or 2 weeks of therapy this enzyme is very likely to be produced and then at that point of time your ceftriaxon will fail so that brings me to this interesting case that we have a patient with seriaxia osteomyelitis so remember that for osteomyelitis the duration of therapy is long it is usually at least 4 to 6 weeks so as i mentioned initially the lab tells me that this is a seriaxia which is pan sensitive so it is sensitive to all our drugs but so what will you choose now i have many options here let's say i choose ceftriaxone or if i choose ceftazidine then in the first or second week of therapy what will happen is that this seriaxia because now it is exposed to a beta lactam antibiotic it will produce this amp c and this amp c will will confer ceftriaxone resistance so uh, and and feel free to ask me questions about all these complicated things at the end of the talk but this is what happens when you have an inducible enzyme so after so this is a patient who in whom if i start ceftriaxone in the second or third week of therapy he will come back to me saying that you know he still has pain in that extremity his esr will have shot up he might have a recurrence of fever and the osteomyelitis which was initially under control now will get out of control because this seriaxia has started now producing mc so i have seen many cases of uh, of third generation cephalosporin in failure because of the fact that down the road in the first or the second week of therapy usually second week of therapy these bugs produce amc remember on the initial cultures this amc may not be very evident so the initial cultures will be will look like a pan susceptible bug but you have to identify what bug you are treating so when you are treating a spice organism when you are treating seriaxia pseudomonas or an indole positive agent or a citrobacter or an enterobacter remember that the their ability to produce amc is enormous so always talk to your micro lab About I always ask them that is this a bug which is likely to produce AMPC? Mm -hmm. They also have certain tests initially in which we look at induced detection of inducible AMPC. So again, always talk to your microbiology lab about AMPC producers, especially when you are planning to use new generation antibiotics or or when you are planning to use first, second, or third generation cephalosporins. So again, if I have a bug which is astronym resistant, carbapenem susceptible. Cefepime susceptible and ceftriaxon ceftazidine resistant. So, any guesses on which enzyme is involved? So, if you analyze, up to the third generation of cephalosporins are resistant. Fourth generation cephalosporins are sensitive. Carbapenems are sensitive. So, again, which enzyme is this likely to be? This is likely to be an AMP C enzyme. So, again, up resistance up to the third generation of cephalosporins. Let's go on to our next question. Klebsiella, which is cefepime resistant, ceftriaxon resistant, meropenem resistant. Ceftazidine may be lactam resistant and only astronam susceptible. So, which is likely? Which is the likely enzyme? As I mentioned, astronam is a funny antibiotic because it is destroyed by almost all enzymes except class B enzymes. So, again, the answer here is that it is going to be a class B enzyme. So, in India, again, the most uh, likely scenario is going to be an NDL. So, this is going to be your Klebsiella producing the New Delhi metallo beta lactamase. Conversely, if I have a Klebsiella which is now astronam resistant but ceftazidine azobactam susceptible, what are the enzymes involved? So the enzymes likely involved all are going to be either KPCs or OXA. So it's either going to be OXA forty eight or KPC. So that is how looking at these cultures you can sort of guess what enzyme is involved. So when I look at these cultures, I know that this is going to be a KPC or an OXA. So now I already know that ceftazidine azobactam is going to work. I know that. The prasidine tazobactam is not going to work. I know that astronam is not going to work. So once I look at these and once what enzyme I am treating, definitely I am in a better shape to take therapeutic decisions. So the moment I see these cultures, I know that this is either KPC or OXA forty eight. In India, the chances of this being OXA forty eight are probably ten times higher than this being KPC. So once I look at these cultures, if I am sitting in India, I know that this is an OXA forty eight uh, producing Klebsiella. So again, to summarize these enzymes, we talked about class A enzymes. Class A enzymes contain ESBLs, importantly, like CTXM, TAM, SHVs, ER, and WEBs, and they contain the carbapenemases KPC. Class B contains only carbapenemases. Important one is NDM in India. Class C contains only AMPCs. Remember the spice organisms that produce AMPCs. And class D again is a very heterogeneous family which contains all sorts of enzymes. Remember OXA forty eight because these are the enzymes of Enterobacteria. So let's quickly go over to non-enzymatic mechanisms. I think I have probably ten or twelve minutes more. 
So let's quickly go over to non-enzymatic mechanisms and we detect these. So if you see uh, non-enzymatic mechanisms, then we have efflux pumps, proline channels, as well as modified EBPs. So again, I won't go into the details of the efflux pump and proline channels, but remember that these are very clinically important resistance mechanisms, but you will have always clues for that. For example, if you have pseudomonas, which is slightly, which has slightly higher MICs for let's say imipenem, but it is meropenem susceptible and it is susceptible to let's say cephalosporins. So you have a pseudomonas which is cephipine susceptible, which is piperacillin tazobactam susceptible, but it is imipenem resistant, only imipenem, isolated imipenem resistance. Then of course I know that this is not an enzyme because hardly is there any enzyme which will give you cephipine susceptibility and imipenem resistance. Well, more likely mechanism here is a mutated porin channel because porin channels are specific for each antibiotic. So look at this pattern here. There is a the, this is the commonest porin mutation, which is known as a loss of OPRD, which gives you imipenem resistance and higher neural MICs, but it gives you susceptibility to all other agents. So again, I don't want to confuse you, but the bottom line here is that you can have efflux mediated mechanisms as well as porin channel mechanisms. Uh, Probably as at some other point of time, I, I will present you our data from Anderson. We had almost close to 100 isolates in one year, which had efflux pump or porin mediated mechanisms of resistance. So this is a very interesting uh, subset, but probably not that relevant to you as, as the hemonc uh, trainees. Probably this is something I will discuss more in an ID conference. So now the most important question here is that can we detect these enzymes does it help us and what is the indian data as well as our own data in the nanath mangeshkar hospital so now can we detect these enzymes really more the most important question is that you might think that you know all this talk about oxas and 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 ctxms was all fine but what is the importance or what is the practical use if we cannot detect them the answer is that we can very well detect these enzymes now we have different ways of detecting it so, as I mentioned, more than 80 to 85 hospitals across the country are using something which is known as the CARBA-R test. There are some hospitals which are using ECM and MCM tests. What we use in Dinarat Mangeshwar is our own in-house sepsis flow panel, which, give, which is a PCR-based panel, which gives us more than 20 enzymes. And then some of you might have used biofire assays, especially, you know, respiratory panels or GI panels. So, biofire also has a blood panel, which tells you certain enzymes. So let us look at the carba R test. Let, let us look at the first one, which is known as the carba R test. So the carba R test, this is this is a sample report of the carba R test. So carba R test is, as I mentioned, used by more than 80 hospitals across the country. It tells you the five basic enzymes. So it tells you imp, women, Indian, which are class B enzymes, and it tells you KPC and OXA48. These are the five enzymes that it can detect. So you have a sample patient here in which it is saying that this is a bug which is producing three different class Bs and OXA48, but KPC not detected. So this is how you get a CARBA-R report. So CARBA-R is a simple test. It is not that expensive. It is run on a gene expert platform. <clears throat> so those of whom you work in hospitals which does the gene expert for TB, definitely talk to your micro lab about whether we can start a CARBA-R test because it is run on the same platform. And it is a good simple test which gives you five basic enzymes. So you, be, you get a good idea of what the carbapenemase is. As I mentioned, KPC is not very common in India. So you get a good idea of what carbapenemase this bug is producing. So it detects only carbapenemase. It does not detect any ESBL, AMC, penicillinase, nothing. It detects only the clinically important carbapenemase. And that's why it is known as the CARBA-R test. So this is the, this, these are some of the uh, uh, sort of sensitivities and specificities that it detects, I won't go into the details. The more simpler test that we have is something known as an ECM and MCM test. So ECM and MCM tests are just tests that tell you whether an enzyme is present. So if you run an MCM test, if it is positive, then run an ECM test. It will tell you whether this is a class B enzyme or a non-class B enzyme. So that's how simple it is. Again, talk to your micro lab if you can get these tests on board. This is what we use in the Nanak Mandesh Hospital. As I mentioned, I started using this as a part of... Uh, my research project initially last year and then we started using it commercially in the next couple of months. So this is a PCR based panel and these are all the different enzymes that it gives me. This is good because you know in the, in once you have growth detected, then in the next four hours or so, this sepsis panel gives me 
the kind of enzyme that this patient is or uh, that this patient's blood is producing. So that's almost says 48 to 72 hours before 48 hours before we can have the actual MICs. It tells you what enzyme it is producing. So this is our real patient here, patient with neutropenic fever. I don't know whether it is. Maybe it could be. So this is a patient with neutropenic fever, and the lab calls you. The blood culture is doing a gram negative bug. So what you tell the lab is to run a PCR based panel, and then in the next four hours, the lab tells you that the organism detected is Klebsiella, and the resistant markers detected. The resistance markers detected are SHV, CTXL, NDM, and OXA48. So what do I know when I look at this? I know that if I use Avibactam, Avibactam will destroy SHV. Avibactam will destroy CTXM and Avibactam will destroy OXA48. But Avibactam will dis not destroy NDM. But as I mentioned, what will be stable against NDM? Astronam. So I know that if I combine Astronam and Avibactam, this will be the best combination for this patient. So as I mentioned, Avibactam is available commercially as Zavisefta or Seftazidine Avibactam. Combine Zavisefta and Astronam, then I will cover this patient. So this was a patient with neutropenic sepsis. 48 hours before we could actually have the MICs, we could change this patient to Zavisefta Astronam, and this patient did well. We have had numerous patients so far. I'll, I'll present some of my own data at the end of the talk if there is time. But we have we have now had almost 120 uh, carbamazepine resistant sepsis flow flows done in our hospital so far. So this is the biofire panel that I talked about. Again, it is similar to CARBAR because it detects the main carbapenemesis. So again, this is another way of doing it. So this is the data from across the country. And this is also sort of congruent with our own in-house data. So which are the common bugs that you see in India? In India, if uh, and I'm talking only about the carbapenemesis. So if you see E. coli, in India, NDM is the commonest. For Klebsiella, actually OXA48 is the commonest. For pseudomonas, clearly class B enzymes are NDMs are commonest. And for acinito again, OXA enzymes are the commonest. So this is what we have. This is our, some of our own in-house uh, data that I talked about. I, again, I won't go into the details of that. But 40% of our carbapenem resistant Klebsiella have also been cholestin resistant. Imagine, enormous. 87% of our carbapenem resistant Klebsiella have been multiple enzyme producers. So like this patient that I showed you, Multiple enzymes have been produced here by this Klebsiella. And this is the usual in India. 60% of our bugs have produced at least two different carbapenemases. Remember, so it's like NDM plus OXA48 producing Klebsiella. CTXM has been the commonest ESBL. For carbapenem resistant Klebsiella, OXA48 followed by NDM like the data I showed you. For E. coli, it's NDM followed by OXA48, which is the commonest. And six out of the 114, and this is, this is something that I updated probably last month, but 6 out of 114 have had genotypic, phenotypic discordance. What do I mean by that? That the sepsis flow tells you that this is an SHV, CTXM, NDM, OXA48. But 48 hours later, when you have the actual MICs, that does not correlate with this report. So this has been found in about 5% of the cases. Again, uh, if you're interested, uh, you can ask me at the end. I won't go into the details of why this happens because it's a little complicated. But please feel free to ask if you're interested. I have the last one minute or so I'll spend on cholestin resistance. <clears throat> Remember, there are many different ways in which an anti a bug can become resistant to cholestin. There are different enzymes like MCR, MGRB, and so on. Interestingly, the biofire pa panel that I showed you identifies one out of them, which is known as the MCR1. So MCR1 identified by the biofire panel, but guess what? Biofire is an American panel which is well suited to the needs of the Western world. So MCR1 is actually not the commonest enzyme of cholestin resistance in India. It's actually the MGR enzyme. So I am not very useful, but just to give you an idea that we also have something now to identify cholestin resistance. The other very important thing that we should know here is, again, I will explain this later on in, uh, in my part B when I talk about therapeutics. But it can be falsely susceptible on the automated panels. So if the lab tells you that your bug is cholestin susceptible, always take it with a pinch of salt. Your, if there is a chance in about 30 to 40% of the cases, there is a chance that this may not be true. If the lab tells you that it is cholestin resistant, unfortunately, it is always true. The reason is that the commercial systems like the Vitec that most of the labs in India use, they give you 
false low MICs of cholestin. So, so bottom line is, if it is cholestin susceptible, always go to a micro lab and try and ask them if it is truly cholestin susceptible. So, always take it with a pinch of salt. Cholestin resistance, unfortunately, has to be believed. So, so that, so that is what I have for this evening. So, in summary, gram-negative resistance can have different mechanisms. As I mentioned, it can be enzyme mediated, it can be loss of porin channels, or it can be flux pumps, or it can be PBP mutations. It is important to understand these mechanisms to optimize therapy. It's important to get familiar with the enzymes. Right now, they might look like very annoying three-letter words to you, but it's very important to acquaint and ourselves and get familiar with the enzymes because in your career, you are going to face this a lot of times. You are going to face a lot of different resistant uh, bugs and you're going to face a lot of enzymes. As Padmat sir mentioned, especially for an oncologist, it's important to get familiar with the mechanisms of gram-negative resistance. Important to know the local enzyme patterns. Always talk to your own hospital about what we are doing to identify these enzymes, what sort of enzymes we have in our setup. It will also help you in planning empiric therapy for your patients. So for you, it will also help you in deciding what agent you use upfront for neutropenic fever, simple neutropenic fever. What do you use? There are some hospitals that use piperacillin, tazobactam, plus or minus amikacin. There are some, most of the Western world uses cefepine. So this is all based on you know what the local prevalence of enzymes and bugs is. So again, very important to know the local enzyme pattern. Essential to identify the enzyme. So always talk to your micro lab, always get them to do resistance testing. In the last one, one and a half years, we have been able to get a lot of different resistance mechanism testing done in the Nalad Mangeshkar Hospital. And next time I'll show you many of the cases in whom the resistance mechanism has helped us actually in taking a therapeutic decision. So that is what I have for this evening. So we basically discussed about mechanisms of resistance and, and its epidemiology and the different enzymes. So next time, basically, I'll focus on the BLBLI combinations, what they cover. I'll focus on what is the actual therapy for ESBL and AMC producers. What is the therapy for carbapenem resistant bugs? When do we use combination therapy? And then I'll finally show you some of the uh, cases that we have had in Vinarath Mangeshkar Hospital and how the PCR-based panel or how knowing the enzyme has helped us in taking a therapeutic decision. So again, thank you for having me this evening. And if you have any questions, feel free to I think open the session for discussion. Thank you very much, Parikshit. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, session. You made it so simple uh, for oncologists and for even hematologists. Uh, going into these technicalities can be a bit uh, demanding, but I think you made it quite simple. And I must mention, uh, you have just uh, recovered or maybe recovering from a COVID infection yourself. But because you uh, have you had committed to this lecture a few months back, uh, you really have uh, spared uh, time to talk with the students. So I really appreciate and thank you very much for that. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> and we have uh, a, a couple of questions. Uh, the, is in the chat box. You, you can have a look at that. The Krupa Bajaj has asked first question. It, we have dealt with it uh, um, a while ago. Methods used at your lab to find different enzymes in culture. I think you already answered that. Now, do you want to add anything? No, I, so I think, uh, you know, uh, it's important to talk to your own microbiology lab, I would say, you know, in what we can do to identify these enzymes. So like I mentioned, more, many of the hospitals across the country use CARBAR. Some of us use uh, a PCR-based technology. Some like CMC actually sequence their enzymes. They have a very, very good setup, probably the best setup in the country to identify gram-negative enzymes is in CMC. So some like them use, you know, sequencing to identify these enzymes. But, but, you know, wherever we are practicing, as I mentioned, the CARBA R test can be run on a gene expert platform. So now most of the hospitals across the country have gene experts because of the prevalence of TB in India. So again, very important to talk to your micro lab and, and try and find out if we can do something to identify these enzymes. So personally, uh, CARBA R, BioFire panel, PCR panel, these are all commercially available. BioFire is actually coming up with an updated panel at the end of 2020, which is known as the uh, BCID2 panel or the sepsis flow 2 panel in which they will have more enzymes than what they had previously. So again, these are different options you have. There are different constraints. For example, the PCR panel that I showed you in our hospital, of course, Padmat sir knows this, but the PCR panel in 
our hospital costs about 4000 so this is an additional uh, expense of course uh, biofire costs about 15 to 16000 rupees the carba R test is 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 uh, probably the cheapest out of all of them so there are different factors you know where you are practicing what is your patient population the affordability what is your micro setup and so on but the bottom line is that you should talk to your micro department and urge them to at least have some form of enzymatic identification because as i'll show you next time this really does change our clinical management now the test which is being done in dinana I mean, 4,000 and identifying 20 enzymes sounds pretty reasonable. Is it commercially available or is it developed in-house? Uh, yes, it is. It is actually a Spanish uh, technology. Uh, they had piloted it initially uh, uh, last year and, and I had enrolled in the pilot project because I wanted to start this project on gram-negative resistance. But then uh, subsequently in 2019, they launched it commercially in India. So there you have I think the machine itself costs about one to two lakhs, the, the machine on which you run it. And then per patient, it, it costs about 4,000. Uh, this is known as, it's, it's, it's known as micro array. Um, I, I, I can share the commercial details of that. And, and it is used across, I don't think a lot of uh, hospitals in India use it, but a lot of European and, and, uh, and American centers actually use the micro array test because it, it is a simple test, again, in 4,000 rupees, about 48 to 72 hours before you have the actual MICs, you can have 20 different enzymes. And our experience has been pretty good. Like I mentioned, only six cases of phenotypic and genotypic discordance that, you know, we actually had, let's say, an ESBL detected, but the bug turned out to be pan-sensitive or the other way around, that the sepsis flow said no marker of resistance detected, and it actually turned out to be uh, let's say a Klebsiella, which was resistant to some of the antibiotics. So this genotypic phenotypic discrepancy has so far been seen only in six, uh, around four to five percent of our patients. Right. Now Suresh Kumar has a question. I think it's a practical question, uh, and every oncologist probably will have. Uh, if we see a pseudomonas, even if it's pan-sensitive, should we use only four generations cephalosporin or carbapenem? Right. So, a uh, very relevant question. I'm glad you asked that. The answer to this is that there is only one third generation cephalosporin which has anti pseudomonal activity, and that's ceftazidi. Other than that, no other cephalosporin has pseudomonal activity, anyways. So, really, the question is should we use ceftazidi or should we use cefepine? If you are going in for long duration of therapy, for example, if you are going in for something like an endocarditis or an osteomyelitis, then it is a very relevant question because AMC can be induced. But the, I, I did not go into the microbiological details with that, probably I'll share it next time. But there are ways of identifying AMC at the outset. So there are certain chemical tests that you can run. Again, this is something we can talk to our micro lab. And they can tell you whether this is likely to be an AMC inducer. Pseudomonas is not a very heavy AMC inducer, but it is something that I would be careful about. So if I'm using it for a short duration of therapy, let's say 7 days or 14 days, I will be okay in using ceftazidine because it is not a very heavy AMC producer. If I'm going to be using it for a long time, then I'll definitely talk to my micro lab and ask them if they can help me with identifying AMC induction for the pseudomonas. Our next question is uh, by uh, Krishna Bajaj. Yeah, inducible AMC assessment at baseline. Uh, is it just a clinical judgment or any other marker uh, can be done before starting uh, antibiotics? Yes. So unfortunately, most of the commercial assays really don't identify AMC in their PCR panels. You can run certain other chemical tests in the lab, as I mentioned, I will probably share with you some of them next time. But you can run certain tests, you know, using certain AMC inducers, like uh, you, you can you can sort of use uh, proxacillin and certain other inducers, and you can see in the lab whether an AMC is being produced. But these, really, these are a little tedious. So uh, right now, commercially, we don't have a great test for AMC detection. So most of the times it is clinical judgment and which bug you are dealing with. So as I mentioned, the spice bugs, so Seracia, Pseudomonas, the indole positive bugs, Citrobacter and Enterobacter. These spice bugs are the five types of bugs in whom I am really concerned about AMC induction. So that is, that is the main thing. And then clinical judgment, duration of therapy, all these things come into play. And if you're really in doubt, then again, as I mentioned, you know, talking to your microlab and, and asking them whether they'll be able to set up those tests for detection of indu induction. But other than that, the commercial screens don't identify AMC. And also in pseudomonas, always prefer to give a combination. 
so when we are uh, planning for two weeks or three weeks therapy what combination usually you prefer to start sir so as i mentioned again it depends on the kind of enzyme that you are dealing with if you are if you are comfortable with the kind of enzyme you are dealing with then i will use monotherapy it's not always that i'll use combination therapy even for a bacteremia for example if i have a pan susceptible pseudomonas then i would be comfortable in using something like cefepime or uh, piperacillin tazobactam or ceftazidine azobactam up front because i know that even if there is amc induction the azobactam will take care of it or even if there is amc induction cefepime will not be affected so it's not always that i use uh, combination therapy combine and and again i will go into the details of combination therapy the next time around but you don't always need combination therapy you need combination therapy only in patients who are really septic who have an underlying uh, uh, immunosuppressive disorder that is not very reversible for example your the neutropenia is not going to be uh, reversed in the next 7 days or so these are the kind of patients in whom you consider combination therapy not everyone needs combination therapy So in that case, we will be happy with the single mono mono therapy, sir. Like uh, it's preferable. Like it's okay. Absolutely. So if I have a patient, let's say who has been given chemotherapy, and I and I and I, and I talk to my oncologist, and he tells me that you know he expects the neutropenia to reverse in the next two or three days, and I have a pan susceptible pseudomonas, I am perfectly comfortable in using something like cefepime or even ceftazidine. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. The next question is by Pramod Kumar. Uh, what is colistin intermediate resistance? What is the meaning of this? Yes. So colistin um, MICs uh, have actually variable cutoffs. You know, if you see the CLSI breakpoints. Um, uh, again, I will go into some of these details in my next talk because I'm going to be talking about colistin resistant cases as well. So if you see colistin MICs, then CLSI breakpoints as well as the UCAS breakpoints, so the American and the European breakpoints. Are a little variable. There is also interlab variation in in colistin MICs. The reason is that you know the commercial media, as I mentioned, they can misinterpret colistin MICs. If you have the truly the best way of getting colistin MICs is doing a test called broth microdilution or or BMD. Broth microdilution and and when it is done in the right way. So in 2018, uh, if you if you see the American Journal of Microbiology, they came up with a detailed set of guidelines. Of how to go about doing colistin MICs. So that is a very good reference paper. So if the uh, the colistin broth microdilution is not an easy test to set up, it is it is a very uh, cumbersome test. It it needs a lot of uh, skilled technical staff. So <clears throat> right now again we know we don't do colistin broth microdilutions. We actually send some of our uh, isolates to CMC to get colistin broth microdilutions done. Um, so again coming back to your question, colistin has Variable um, MICs because there is some interlab variation because of the fact that you know the standardized broth microdilution is difficult. And again, the commercial uh, systems like Vitek or Bactek they misidentify colistin resistance, so they can give you false low MICs of colistin. In general, up to MICs of two are acceptable. Uh, the again colistin resistance is a complex topic so there is something called hetero resistance that you will have resistance with different mechanisms then there is enzymatic resistance that i talked about where you have the mcr mgr b mediated resistance so so practically the bottom line is that we should always talk to our lab and ask them if we are using the commercial systems or they are doing broth microdilution if ever we are in doubt we should ask them to do broth microdilution we have had at least i can at least remember about 15 to 20 cases in the last year wherein the um, uh, automated uh, systems told us told us that this is colistin susceptible and then once we did the broth microdilution it turned out to be colistin resistant but well, practically when you are managing the patient uh, how uh, how do you handle the situation which patient you decide to send you for broth microdilution microdilution Or how to give the <laughs> right. uh, the commercial assay? I mean, right. So, sir, so for Klebsiella, the incidence is the highest. So, when I have Klebsiella, which is carbapenem resistant, forty percent of that is likely to be colistin resistant as well. So, I know that the chances of false susceptibility are the highest for Klebsiella. For Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, I usually don't send them for broth microdilution unless the patient is not responding. I mean, we have had two or three patients in whom. Repeated cultures kept growing poly uh, acinato even on polymixin, and that is the time we sent it for broth microdilution, and then actually it came back as resistant. So these are odd cases because the incidence of colistin resistance 
in carbapenem resistant pseudomonosal acinetoid is less than 5%. Whereas for Klebsiella, it is almost 40%. So Klebsiella, almost all of them, uh, I send for block microdilution. With pseudomonas acinato, I send them only if the patient is not responding. Or initially, the patient is, let's say, in neutropenic septic shock, and I can't afford to go wrong. So pseudomonas acinato, I send it, and E. coli as well, I send it far more selectively. Klebsiella, I send it more liberally. Right. So I think this is the last question for today evening. Uh, Sandeep uh, Bhairava has asked this question. How important is enzymatic, uh, enzymatic classification for NRP bacteria like uh, bacteroids? So, practically speaking, not very important because most of, uh, of the bac uh, bacteroids and most of the anaerobes are, are usually susceptible to uh, the commercially available anaerobic agent. So if you see, you talk about BLBLIs, then if you think of uh, drugs like augmentin or for bacteroids, especially drugs like neuropenem, usually they are susceptible. So en enzymatic mediated resistance is not a huge problem as far as anaerobic bacteria like bacteroids are concerned. I think that was the last question. Uh, it was wonderful to have you with us and the interaction was also very good. It's a complex topic. Um, more and more oncologists and hematologists uh, need to be uh, conversant with uh, the language the ID specialist is talking about because um, uh, the, as, with the advent of this uh, New Delhi metalloproteinase, uh, we uh, have to work as a team, the oncologists, hematologists and the ID specialists because uh, coming time is going to be a nightmare for all of us uh, you know, with the uh, rampant abuse of antibiotics in treating the most basic infections. So I think it's very important and probably a right time to have you with us. And thank you very much for being with us and answering the questions. Uh, let's hope we uh, have you sometime pretty soon for the second uh, uh, episode of your talk. Uh, till then, uh, goodbye and good night. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for having me. Goodbye, everyone.